Dr. Decker, welcome to the Nailed It Ortho podcast. So happy to have you. We have been looking forward to this talk. And it's a good one, uh, a high yield topic, but uh, welcome to the podcast. I appreciate you guys. Thanks for having me on tonight. Of course. And we always, we typically generally start off our podcast asking us a couple of questions, um, getting to know you, and then we kind of go into the topic of the day. So our first question is kind of just a general question. Do you have any advice that you would give to yourself um, starting residency, being where you are now and looking back at it? Is there anything that you would advise yourself, um, you know, that that you should do or be on the lookout for? Or just, you know, just general advice. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, actually, yeah, I think that might be the first time that's ever been asked, in, in, uh, at least of me. And I think the best thing I could say is take no moment for granted in your training. It seems like it's a long time, five years. It's not. It goes by so fast. And there's nothing you can't take from one subspecialty and apply it to another. And so, you know, take advantage of every single opportunity you've got and uh, uh, try to find a way to apply it. <clears throat> yep. I think that's some great, a great tip and something that we actually hear from most of the, you know, uh, senior attendings and things like that that come onto the show, they always say, hey, don't don't let those uh, years in residency uh, pass you by without learning as much as you can. So something I try to remember all the time, no matter, you know, what's going on, just try to make sure you get a little bit better each day. Um, as far as the second question, just something that's kind of outside of orthopedics, Dr. Decker, with, um, let's say with everything that's kind of going on with the pandemic and everything, a lot of things have either you've had to slow them down or you're not able to do certain things or you can't do them with who you probably would before. Once everything get back to normal, whenever that is, what, what will be one of the first things you think you would probably get back to doing that you're not able to do so much right now? Oh, what a good question. I, so I've got, um, I've got three little kids right now. They're uh, eight and a half, five and a half and going on maybe about seven months right now. And I tell you, the, uh, the pandemic has affected them much more than it has me. Uh, certainly, I miss doing my routine. I miss operating more. Uh, we can't do a lot of elective cases right now, but um, with, for them being out of school and missing their friends and, and really missing family, not being able to go anywhere and see anybody, uh, my first move will be immediately now that I finally passed uh, part two boards this last week is uh, we can finally go on a trip. Congrats. Uh, yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. It's awesome. time to go see some family, go on a big trip. And I've got some, uh, a co-fellow of mine in Australia. I'm hopeful to go out and visit uh, as soon as I can get on an airplane again safely. So it's time to, time to go see the world a little bit because life is short and, and, and uh, you never know. Uh, you, you miss these moments. You, you, a year is a long time when you've got little ones. So get them out and see the world when we've still got that time. Completely, 100% agree. And I think that'll be a good transition to our third question is, do you have any hobbies that you take part of in outside of medicine. You know, sometimes we always think of medicine, 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 but is there anything else that you like to do outside of work? Yeah, um, I used to do a lot of biking that is uh, tailored off a little bit in the last year or so. Life's been so busy with, um, with work. I love getting out in the mountains. I love taking the kids hiking. Uh, we go as often as we can. You know, <laughs> my oldest one, who's now eight and a half, like I said, uh, it was, she was four years old and uh, we took her on about a five and a half mile hike and she did the whole thing on her own. Um, pretty proud of the little one. So we love to get out there in the woods and kind of hide and, and go for long hikes. And uh, I miss doing that a lot. So uh, that those are our favorite things to do. And we've actually got some time to do it. Yeah. That sounds fun. I mean, that sounds like a, a great thing to do with your kids and things. I, I'm not too, I, I probably never been hiking, but it just seems like it'll be fun. I think <laughs> I'll probably re, read up about a few things and see exactly what you do when you go out there. But I, like, I would, uh, I would like to just spend that type of time with, with family, you know, out there in nature, just kind of hanging out, you know, it sounds fun. Yeah. It's nice getting lost. I grew up around the Chicagoland area, um, in the suburbs and, uh, uh, moving to the city, uh, moving out here was a totally different uh, experience. And so, you know, it's 15 minutes, you can get lost in the woods in a hurry and you start to really enjoy it once you experience it the first few times. Yeah, that sounds like a great time. Uh, Dr. Decker, we're going to go ahead and get into uh, today's talk, uh, periprosthetic hip uh, fracture. So uh, we're going to give a, a case. Um, yeah, we'll give a case, but you know, It'll, it'll assist with our talk. So yeah, we can use this to kind of help us get along. Um, but so say you're on call, you get a, 
call from the emergency department. They say that there's a 72 year old male uh, with a history of a left total hip arthroplasty that was done eight years ago. And he now presents to the ED after a ground level fall uh, that happened earlier today. Say since this fall, he has not been able to ambulate and he seems to have a deformity to his, um, his lower extremity. Kind of how are you working this patient up? What are some of the things you're looking for in H&P? Yeah, so I think uh, the most important thing I think you got to remember when you're working these patients up is that, uh, one, the history sounds pretty convincing for what you might expect. Uh, assume the worst, uh, traumatic fall, even ground level in an older patient. Uh, if they didn't have a total hip in, they'd be a high risk for a hip fracture. It's no different with the hip in. Uh, they're at high risk for periprosthetic fracture. More important than that, though, is to make sure you kind of step back and consider what some of the risks are uh, for uh, such an injury, uh, history of osteoporosis, um, when the index procedure was, any complications they had with the index procedure is really important to know, uh, and especially any history of infection-related complications. There's a pretty significantly high um, association between periprosthetic fractures and uh, periprosthetic joint infection, uh, something like about one in 10. So it's not an insignificant number. So really making sure you delve back into the history around that implant. Uh, knowing that the when that hip implant went in is also, I think, a really important factor. Um, the history of uh, highly crosslinked polyethylene and uh, conventional polyethylene and when those came out um, is important as osteolysis used to be a major risk factor for injuries like this. Um, and it was around 2001 or 2002 that we started to see the adaptation of highly crosslinked. So the incidence of osteolysis related fractures started to decrease. So a patient who had a hip in 1997 versus 2007 have a very different risk profile. So make sure you know when the hip was put in, what the implants are. First thing you ought to go do is start digging for records, uh, seeing what you can find about what implants are in there, if they've ever had any revisions to the implant. And then I, I think really understanding if there's any uh, predisposing uh, symptoms. Um, did the patient have any pain prior to their fall? Uh, what was the real reason for their fall? You know, patients who have a history of being on osteoporotic medications, um, such as bisphosphonates or denosumab, uh, might have an atypical uh, pattern to their injury. So uh, really make sure you understand uh, uh, any potential predisposing factors for this injury. I'm actually okay. glad that you, you mentioned all that like you did, because I, I think it's, it's, you know, I don't know, that's probably not going to get you an answer on a board question, but in real life, I think that makes so much of all that that you mentioned, it makes a, a huge difference. So um, paying attention to when the original procedure was done, was, was there any complications? Had there been wound problems? Had there been infections? Um, had you been hurting before you fell, you know, or was this just a slip over the dog? You know, what's going on around the time of the injury? Like all those things, um, I know, especially earlier on, uh, maybe not so much now, but earlier on, like an uh, intern or just kind of earlier in your residency, it, you don't realize how important some of the, the previous, you know, surgical information and just their overall, how their outcome was from the hip, how important that is when they come in uh, with this new fracture, you kind of just focus on what's going on now, but some of the older things does matter. Absolutely. I try not to get tunnel vision in these, especially with the younger residents. You see a broken bone and next thing you think is how do I fix it? But there's a lot that can go into that. A lot of history there. And, and are there any, are there any, I know we just spoke about, you know, implants and that type of a history. Is, are there any technical factors um, that we should know of that are more risk factors for uh, undergoing a periprosthetic uh, fracture? Like, is it, you know, the, the type of uh, prosthesis used or the, the technique, anything like that? That's a good question. I think it depends on that time frame. So I think let's use your case as a good example. Uh, say eight years out um, uh, for a periprosthetic fracture, assuming everything else is pretty standard on the patient, no major medical history or anything. Uh, typically, you know, you, you worry mostly about um, malpositioned implants, cemented or cementless, but cementless implants in particular um, have a, a particularly higher uh, incidence of periprosthetic fracture, uh, the, both early and late uh, postoperative fractures. Uh, and in terms of implant position and implant design, it can be a risk factor as well. Um, you know, varus uh, implants tend to be somewhat of a higher risk for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is they tend to be undersized when they go in. You put them in in varus and they tend to be three-point fixation techniques as opposed to a true uh, uh, circumferential press fit. Uh, 
So they're, they're at a bit of a higher risk of subsidence, which can lead to fracture. Um, uh, and then the, the type of the implant itself, uh, whether they be an ML taper stem or a, a, a dual taper stems, uh, might have a higher risk of rotational instability. So if they're starting to develop looseness, uh, loosening, and then they uh, have a, a high torque event like getting up and out of a chair, they can twist inside the canal and cause a periprosthetic fracture. So cementless implants in particular, for a lot of reasons, are a bit of a higher risk. And what is an ML tapered stem versus a dual tapered stem? Is that just a, a modular stem or what? what is oh, yes. Yeah, so my apologies. Yeah. So ML taper uh, discusses the kind of a medial lateral uh, taper, which means the implant really engages the medial cortex and the lateral cortex of the femoral canal. And when the implant grows or you increase in size, it only grows in that plane. It doesn't engage anterior to posterior. A dual wedge uh, stem essentially is kind of like the one you're looking at there, uh, but slightly different. The geometries grow both medial to lateral and anterior to posterior. So they're kind of more the fit and fill concept. They take up a lot more of the metaphysis of the femur approximately. Hmm. Yep. And I'm actually glad that you mentioned about uh, why you don't want to put your stem in in any varus because I was I was going to ask you that during this talk. And yeah, so like you said, it's just pretty much you may not be actually um, getting a good fit on all the different uh, cortices. Is, is that pretty much what you were saying? Yeah, that's right. I think you really got to three out of four. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. If, you, if you undersize these stems or don't get the right fit, you can fool yourself into thinking it's a stable stem when it's not. Um, and that can lead to, uh, we kind of always look in the OR for that axial stability. So making sure that it's all the way down and rotational stability. So that when you put torque on, it doesn't spin, but undersizing and putting it in varus or valgus alignment can lead to a loss of that rotational stability. It's a high risk for fracture. Yep. And we'll definitely probably touch back on to some of that as well. Once we get into, you know, some of the operative treatment of, of these types of fractures, but, um, so say you, you're in the emergency department and you got a bit of a workup on this patient and you kind of have an idea of what's going on. What kind of images are you usually getting uh, for these patients? So uh, standard films for an injury like this, uh, AP pelvis radiograph, a good one. Uh, and with something with a, um, a templating marker or something you can calibrate the image off of. Uh, so you know, if you can't get records, you can at least determine sizes based on some calibration. Uh, you want to get a good AP of the femur, full-length films of the bone that's broken, uh, following your orthopedic principles. And then from a, a lateral standpoint, I'm a, I'm a proponent of getting a cross-table lateral film uh, for periprosthetic fractures. I think you want to know what your implant position looks like on both the femur and the acetabulum, just in case there's other issues you need to address during the surgery. You want to have a good full assessment of that. Hard to get a frog leg lateral film of a periprosthetic fracture any of that without hurting <laughs> patients. So yeah. I wouldn't recommend I think the other thing to consider, and in rare cases, you may need to consider getting CT scan, uh, though generally speaking, these fractures will uh, show you most of what you need to see on radiographs. Some of these can be minimally displaced, and especially in these spiral fractures, uh, kind of an image you see here, uh, you'd be surprised sometimes you might find an extended fracture line distal uh, to the more obvious proximal fracture line, which will, stay, will fundamentally change what implant you use to fix it with. So. Uh, I think that's an important thing to consider if you're not certain of the extent of the fracture. Now, I had a question because uh, first start off, I was always confused by these and how you know if the implant is stable or not just from looking at the radiographs. So do you have any uh, any tips or tricks on how to figure out or, or things that you look at each time when you look at x-rays where you say, okay, well, this implant is more likely to be unstable versus this one. Oh, that looks like a stable implant. Like, what are you actually looking at? Yeah, that is an exceptionally difficult uh, 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 issue. Uh, so B1 and B2 fractures, which is really what we're, we'll get into that in a little bit, but the stable versus unstable implant uh, can be almost impossible to truly assess on x-ray. There's a couple of very obvious signs of a loose implant. One, I would say in a cementless implant, if the fracture is obviously through the ingrowth or ongrowth surface of the proximal aspect of the implant, then it's very likely, if not guaranteed to be loose. And that makes some sense. You're just simply breaking through the area where the stem has actually got an opportunity to grow in or on. It can't still be fixed to the bone if it's off. Um, there's also, if you've got preoperative radiographs from uh, prior, uh, prior imaging from this patient's surgery, stem subsidence is a good indicator 
of whether or not the implant is loose. So if you've got comparative films, it's really helpful here. Um, and then if those are the two major things you can look at in terms of uh, radiographs. Outside of that, it gets quite difficult uh, to really assess that on radiographs and you really need to have a high suspicion for it being loose and have some intraoperative techniques in order to assess stability before you make that determination. Okay, perfect. And um, just to recap, you said two of, the, two of the big things that you look for, you're seeing if that fracture line is through the ingrowth or part of that implant. And then you also look for stem subsidence, which you can, use, which you can uh, compare with the old uh, radiographic films. Um, now, I know we touched on it a little bit earlier, we gave people a tease of B1 and B2, but um, since we're on it, can we kind of talk about this classification system, how to classify these and, uh, and you know, it's important, can, kind of, can you, you walk us through that? Actually, before, before we get to that, just because we have these, um, we have these pictures up on, on, our, on our YouTube show, uh, Dr. Decker, do you mind just kind of describing what you see on these three different x-rays that we have here? And yeah. just maybe even, you know, if you think they are stable versus unstable, just looking at what you have now, and I know this is an incomplete series for all three of these, but just what your thoughts might be. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let's start over on the, uh, on the left there. I'm looking at, you got uh, what appears to be a cementless stem and cementless acetabular component. And you see what looks like a fracture in the proximal aspect of the femur in the greater trochanteric region through what appears to be a lytic lesion. And there appears to be some lysis on the medial aspect of the fem uh, femur as well around the calcar. And when you see that, you know, right away, your suspicion is for, you know, eccentric polyethylene wear in an older component because you have these lytic lesions, which that's somewhat what it appears to be on that x-ray, but that femoral head doesn't appear to be sitting center in the acetabulum. Now that's interesting because that stem from what you can possibly see on that x-ray, this is why it's important to know what and identify your implants. Um, this appears to be a cementless stem with a metaphyseal uh, ingrowth or ongrowth surface. So that fracture does go through that area, but just distal to where that fracture is, you can see where there's still on or ingrowth surface there that appears to have a, a pretty good interface with the bone. There's no radial loosened line there. So suspicion in an injury like that is that that's probably still a stable stem. Uh, the middle radiograph uh, again, similar, this is cementless femoral and cementless acetabular components, reasonably aligned, and the fracture is just at the distal tip of the stem there. It does not, and it's a, a transverse fracture, almost looks like a high energy type injury. Uh, this is usually encouraging for uh, being a stable implant as uh, a stem like this, you can see there's that proximal surface that appears to be where the fixation is, has no disruption in it, and the pattern would imply that there's probably not a spiral or some type of other fracture line into that. Uh, area. So it's probably, although no guarantee, a stable stem. And then the, the one on the right is the more difficult one. Uh, this is what appears to be an ML, what we were talking about earlier, an ML taper stem, uh, where uh, the real fixation comes from making intimate contact with the calcar immediately and the, the lateral cortex. And you can see pretty well on that stem where the ingrowth or ongrowth surface stops. That fracture, though it looks like it's at the distal tip of the stem, you can see it looks like it goes up the posterior cortex there quite a ways. And depending on how this was put in, uh, the ingrowth surface appears to be um, distal to the uh, neck cut or calcar. So though it could have been put in there or it could have subsided into that position and become fixed over time, assuming it was put in uh, where the neck cut was, that looks like a potentially subsided stem. So high suspicion for a loose implant there, though, again, you'd have to confirm that intraoperatively. Yep. It, and it, 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 I mean, no matter how hard I try, uh, if I get someone, you know, who's been doing this for however long, they always find something that I didn't see. Like I might get the, I might get it right and be like, yeah, that's, that's most likely unstable, right? You know, we're still gonna test it intraoperatively, but I, I bet that's unstable. But like say that first picture, I, I, Cody, me and Cody do questions together sometimes. He mm -hmm. probably recognized that the wear around the femoral head was like, it's eccentric in, in the cup. I totally did not see that. I, I just totally, <laughs> yeah, totally, it's hard. totally missed that. Yeah. So that's why I like to hear, you know, your, you know, our, our guest thoughts on these things, because it helped me kind of point these things out next time. Now I know to make sure you look there, you know, that's one of the things you got to look at as well. Absolutely. All right. 
And I think Cody was heading towards this next. As far as the classification, what is the the popular classification that we usually go go with for these type fractures? And uh, I guess what's their significance, you think? I actually, so this is one of the rare classifications in orthopedics I think is really useful. And, uh, you know, we talk about classifications all the time. And the question always to me is, what value do they add to classify it? If it doesn't guide treatment, it probably isn't of a, a ton of value. Vancouver classification, the one we use here for periprosthetic fractures, is one of those rare ones that actually does guide treatment. You give it a classification, it has a treatment algorithm. So the Vancouver classification has been around for a long time. And it's pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward. Um, it's broken up into Vancouver A, B, and C. And there's some subclassifications for it. Uh, Vancouver A classification, uh, or the Vancouver A, is essentially a fracture in the trochanteric region, whether that's the greater or the lesser, occasionally both. Um, and then there's the Vancouver B, uh, which is broken into three subsets. Uh, the B, as a general category, is around the or at the distal tip of the uh, implant. That's kind of vague in its terminology, but there's a pretty distinct difference when you finally see these injuries between a B and a C. B1, 2, and 3 are, are divided up by implant stability and bone stock. So B1 is a stable implant. Simply put, the implant is still adhered to the bone, uh, so you can treat this like a fractured bone. Uh, B2 is a different animal. Uh, these are the ones I tend to see the most of. Uh, these are uh, a fracture around the implant and the implant has now come loose. The good news is in B2, say you still got bone stock to work with. B3s are thankfully pretty rare, uh, but they are a real mess when they happen. This is an a fracture around the implant with a loose implant and now you've got serious bone stock issues that you can't really use for fixation. These become very difficult to treat. Uh, Vancouver C uh, is a simply a fracture in the bone that has an implant in it, but it's pretty far away from the implant. Uh, so these are kind of like B1s. You can treat them like a broken bone. Um, mm -hmm. So that's the, that's the classification we use. This is a highly tested uh, classification for that very reason. It's pretty predictable how to treat things once you classify it correctly. Yep. It's, go, on, go ahead, Jay. Um, well, I was just going to kind of state restate what he just said, like how this is being something that's high yield. I mean, it's yeah. a pimp question. It is helpful in clinic, and it's going to be on your boards. Uh, very high yield uh, and leading on to the second part that we're going to go into in a second about treatment. But um, so Dr. Decker, we already talked about, you know, how to look at one of these and kind of determine is this, you know, B1 versus B2. Uh, but as far as B2 to B3, like what are we looking for? What are we looking for in the x-ray when we're trying to determine about the bone stock? Yeah, so it, it depends on a couple factors. Um, and again, this is, this is where kind of the nuance or the vagueness of the classifications come into play. I think what you're looking at here is that in a B1 to a B2, what changes from being a stable versus unstable implant is really an intraoperative assessment. Uh, the good news is that differentiating the two, uh, you kind of are planning to deal with both in the operating room, but you've got good bone in either situation. It's the B2 to B3, what determines if you don't have adequate or good bone stock? Most of the times you're dealing with, in those cases, patients who have some type of condition that compromises their bone. So severe osteoporosis, uh, inflammatory arthritis uh, that's in advanced stages with decreased um, uh, bone stock, uh, or very thin cortices, I should say. Uh, patients with osteolysis uh, who have massive proximal bone loss from lytic lesions, um, previous metallosis that lead to bone loss. Um, Stress shielding, uh, patients who have uh, stems uh, put in 25 years ago that were distally fixed, and so the top of the bone never really saw any force, and so it resorbed. And so that bone is essentially a, a shell of itself, um, and it's not very good for using to fix an implant to. Or there's so much comminution in the fracture uh, around that implant that you essentially can't really rely on it for much of anything. All those, I think, are reasonable to consider as poor situations where the bone stock is poor and that you can't really rely on that for good fixation. Okay. Now, um, given, you know, we know this classification of Vancouver classification, um, well, how do you go about treating them? I guess we could maybe break it down by classification and then how you would treat that, but can we kind of go into that? Unless Jay, yeah. unless you have anything else? No, no. I mean, that's, that's fine. Very good. Treatment. Okay. Perfect. 
So start with the A's. Uh, Vancouver A's, um, it depends on the, the reason for the injury to some extent uh, and how you're going to treat it. So most of the time when we're talking about A's, we have either a greater trope fracture or lesser trope fracture. Uh, the greater trope fractures are commonly associated with either some type of low energy mechanism uh, trauma, such as a ground level fall, a direct blow to the trochanter, uh, or more commonly, at least what I would say most of us are seeing in practice is patients who had a conventional cross-linked polyethylene with a lot of poly wear, and either they have a fall or, or even just a, an avulsion type injury where the, the bone finally gave because of lysis. Uh, the good news is with these types of injuries, they can typically be treated non-surgically. When you see one, you got to really identify why and when it happened. And then a couple of important things to note. One is if... Uh, the vastus lateralis insertion is intact, there's a good chance that that uh, fragment, that bone fragment, will not try to escape proximally. That's really when you're in danger of having functional problems is when the trochanter starts to migrate proximally because the abductors start pulling on it. So as long as that's intact and the bone does not displace roughly about two to two and a half centimeters, uh, you could usually get away with treating these non-surgically. But if they start to escape, you've got to essentially find a way to pull them back down. Uh, this is a really hard injury to treat because bones don't really like to heal under tension and abductors are applying tension at the fracture site. So the, the typical way to fix them is to put a trochanteric claw plate uh, over top of the trochanteric fragment and cable it to the femur to try to resist that tension force from the abductors. And the outcomes are okay, they do okay. Uh, fibrous union is probably the more likely outcome than not for most of these, but uh, anything that keeps the troch from escaping and giving the patient abductor function is usually a good, uh, good thing. Uh, lesser troch fractures, they're a little less of a problem most of the time. If it's a true lesser trochanter avulsion fracture, again, lysis uh, from uh, highly cross, or excuse me, from conventional polyethylene being the most common reason, not much to do about that. They can cause some pain, um, but usually not a problem. But if they're associated with a bigger injury, such as uh, like a posterior uh, calcar fracture, those might need to get treated surgically, uh, but it's pretty uncommon. Okay. And yeah, so I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned the uh, deforming forces that you're going to see on the greater trochanter um, and why you, you know, which ones you have to, to kind of think about, like the vastus lateralis and the abductors when you, uh, when you see these fractures, that's for periprosthetics or not, you know, um, even if there's not a prosthesis, some of the indications are somewhat um, similar. You know, I know displacement, it might be a little bit more displacement for uh, without a prosthesis. I thought it was maybe five centimeters, but I could be wrong. But displacement of the greater troch is uh, important. So I'm glad that we mentioned that. We talked about the lesser. Um, and yeah, a lot of time it can be non-operative and kind of see how they do from there. Um, so moving on to probably most of the, the meat and potatoes of the talk, how are you treating the different uh, B classifications? Yeah, this is, um, these are tricky. Uh, so I think whenever you see a, a Vancouver B periprosthetic fracture, the first thing you got to do is plan to do, uh, plan to revise the hip and plan to fix the femur every time. So make sure you have implants available for both of those things. And so that's the, the number one thing that you can take away from a kind of more clinical, um, excuse me, the more clinical takeaways, just make sure you're prepared to do everything. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of what you do in the operating room, I think the first thing you got to do is how, determine how you're going to assess if the implant's stable or not. And there's some controversy here in terms of how you do that. Uh, one method is to open up the fracture site and try to assess implant stability of or excuse me, the stability of the implant relative to the uh, proximal femoral fragment. I think that's a little technically difficult to do, whether or not you can really tell if an implant's stable by seeing if the tip of that stem moves relative to the proximal bone fragment, because it's a lot to control trying to torque those two away from each other. I'm a big proponent of opening up the hip capsule and looking, uh, seeing if there's any risk or any, uh, any signs that that implant is loose. So uh, there's controversy in the literature about that. I think uh, there's a lot of techniques you can use, but you've got to be confident in your technique. So find one that works for you and use it. So are you, when you opening up the, the caps, are you actually dislocating them or, um, you know, kind of what, what is your, kind your of, thoughts on that? 
Yeah, that for me at least, and again, I think you'll get different answers from different surgeons on this, but for me, I'll open up the hip capsule and I'll dislocate it. Mm-hmm. And I really want to torque on that stem and give it some good axial and rotational forces. I want to see if that thing will move because the outcomes, if you miss it, are really poor. Uh, you've done a lot of work to fix a femur around a loose implant that you didn't realize was loose. And now you might have to take a lot of that fixation out in order to get a revision stem in. So though it is morbid, don't get me wrong. Uh, and there's risk of recurrent dislocation. If you kind of go back in and out of the hip capsule a bunch of times, finding out now, I think saves you a lot of uh, angst later. So I'm a, I would say get in there and check it pretty thoroughly. So if you, because if you get in there, you know, you open up the capsule, you check it, you know, there's not much play. Uh, it's rotationally stable. How do you go about um, fixing the fracture? Do you have um, something that you prefer? Do you prefer a lateral plate? Do you use your clodge wires? I know there's a lot of different ways, but are there any techniques and kind of principles in treating these um, stable uh, B1 periprosthetic fractures? Yeah, B1s. Um, I think this is also why I like to go from the top to check that stem stability. Because if you had a B1 fracture, I really like to stay away from the fracture site if I can now. I don't want to open it up and devascularize de- de- around the fracture site. So I, I, my preferred technique in those situations is to try to do a, as a minimally invasive a plate fixation as I can. I prefer a lateral locking plate construct. And I kind of treat these patients like, uh, like you would a hip, a hip fracture patient or presumed to be, have abnormal bone. Um, they uh, had a pretty significant injury and they have a high morbidity mortality. Uh, I don't want this to happen to them again. So I tend to treat the whole bone. I, I use a lateral locking plate and I try to go from distal femur up to the troch and uh, protect the whole bone for the future. So I'll try to put a, a minimally invasive uh, submuscular plate in from distal uh, around the knee. And then in terms of technique and how you fix it, uh, you really want to make sure you get kind of eight cortices distal and anywhere from six to eight cortices proximal, depending on your fixation technique with screws or cable or um, uh, wires up top. And as far as once you get past the fracture, how many, because this is, this is a pretty long plate. We're going from the greater troke all the way to the distal femur. So once we get past the fracture, how many screws are you putting in? Is it every hole that you're going to put a screw in or is it every other kind of, what, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's uh, so- it's a good question. Around the stem and distal to the fracture, I think, get treated very differently. You want to make sure you have adequate working length in your plate distally. So you don't want to go fill in every hole distally. That's why I really focus on a couple screws distal in that distal femoral uh, segment, one or two screws maybe centrally. And then once you get around the stem, though, I think fixation can be very difficult depending on what stem is in there. Uh, Cemented stems, tend to have a good mantle around them. And the nice thing about cemented stems is you can fire screws into that cement bicortically, which give you a, a lot more fixation than unicortical screws or cables. So I tend to like to try to get bicortical fixation through the cement mantle up top. And up there, you know, I kind of aim the same way. This is more kind of personal preference, but I think of a cable like a single cortex fixation with better rotational control. So unicortical screws and cables in my mind each count as a courtesy when I'm thinking of fixation. And then bicortical screws obviously is two. So I'm shooting if I can to get at least kind of six cortices, if not eight cortices equivalents up top around that stem when I'm going for fixation. I try to let that dictate for me how many, how many screws or cables I put around that proximal segment. Uh, otherwise, I, I think it can get a little bit uh, uh, too much on gestalt and you kind of lose track of what you're trying to accomplish. Okay. And because um, I know I was reading a, reading a paper, I think it was on a Richie's paper, and uh, he quotes and saying that, you know, unicortical lock screws um, aren't really recommended. So um, I think you mentioned, uh, you know, that kind of being like one cortex of uh, fixation. Do you, do you tend to use unicortical lock screws in, in your constructs or, or do you kind of just even, it even on the And fracture? also on that, what are, what are your thoughts on just doing non-locking screws? So do you always do locking? That's a good question too. So to kind of to answer them both together, I think unicortical locking screws offer some um, additional proximal fixation uh, that is a little bit, I think, more um, uh, reliable than just cable fixation alone. So this is important. You can't just do unicortical locking screws as your proximal fixation alone. I think uh, Ricci's paper is absolutely right. You have really no torsional or rotational control with just unicortical locking screws. So if you're going to use them, they're more of an adjunct to the rest of your fixation. So 
there's a lot of people I think who are advocating now for a combination of unicortical screws and cerclage cables in order to get a combination of fixed angle construct as well as some torsional control with the use of those cables. Uh, so I'll never use unicortical, unicortical locking screws alone. Uh, it, it simply does, it won't work, it'll fail. Um, I try to use them in adjunct with those cables and I, I'll always try to get at least one, if not two screws, if I can, fired around the stem at some point along that proximal fixation in order to increase the, uh, the torsional um, uh, strength of the construct. As far as which screws you use proximally at the, fra at the stem site, I tend to use uh, locking screws up there because they tend to be unicortical. So I think you get a, a more uh, greater construct stiffness um, if you're in the setting of using unicortical screws with those locking screws. I think there's too high a risk that non-lockers will pull out. Distally, I don't think it's as important. Um, it depends on your fracture pattern, certainly, and uh, inherent fracture stability. Um, but I tend to use non-locking screws distally. Okay. So like a hybrid type of thing. So, um, yep. And I think we probably gave all the the the, the real heat to Dr. Uh, Decker here. But Cody, just because we're, we're at two different institutions and things, and you guys see a lot of high level, uh, high energy trauma and things like that. How are you guys usually positioning this patient, I guess, and what approach are y'all taking to the to the femur usually with these? Yeah, so I think it um probably on a, on a case by case basis, but I know some of our attendings may just go ahead and position this patient lateral and um, use the approach that they'd use for um, they'd be lateral that way in the case that you need to go ahead and actually just do a, a, a revision hip prosthesis. They're already in that position. You don't have to change things up. So some people may do, um, you know, I guess whatever that surgeon's preferred choices, if it's, if that surgeon is an anterior lateral uh, person that, that likes that approach, then, you know, they may kind of use that approach and uh, use that to do a, a lateral lock plate. Um, but I, I think they're, many ways to skin the cat per se, mm -hmm. but I know, you know, just thinking about it, a lot of people may go ahead and position and with the thought process, if we had to go ahead and do a total that we can, that we don't have to, you know, move and, and, and redrape and close this wound uh, in order to do that. What about, uh, what about you? Yeah, something Budding similar, fellow. Yeah, right. So, something <laughs> similar, man. It's gonna be, uh, you know, lateral, um, yeah, louder on a Jackson, and probably, I guess it depends on what we really think about this, the prosthesis as far as its stability, but probably really like some kind of subvastus approach down to the femur, open it up all the way from the, just under, yeah, like just proximal to the greater trochlear all the way down to the distal femur so we can protect the whole bone, like Dr. Decker was explaining. Um, as far as testing the stability now that's the that's the one it depends on who who i'm with and what they would do and i've seen it like dr decker say where you dislocate the whole hip um and i've seen sometimes where you just try to put some rotation like some torsional uh rotational type force onto the uh, the prosthesis and look at the proximal segment so i've seen both ways but you know i think like you say different ways to skin a cat yeah yeah and and so yeah dr decker i guess Moving on, because I think this was good. We spent a little time on the B1 just because, I don't know, we could talk about them all in general in some fashion. Uh, but moving on to like the B2s and B3s, kind of what uh, what things are you thinking about when you taking this to the OR? Yeah, these are, um, of periprosthetic fractures, I think these are my favorite. Um, these, are, these are tough cases. Uh, B2s, I think a couple of things that, one thing I didn't hit on before, I think you, you ought to consider cemented stems and how to assess their stability. A cemented stem that has a fracture through the cement mantle, I would assume to be loose almost invariably. Uh, whether that be a slip taper stem or a, a composite beam stem, they're so reliant upon the intact cement mantle for stability. If there's a fracture in the cement, there's a it's, it's a loose component. Just something to touch on real quick as we get into this one. B2s are, uh, are, are really, um, they're tough cases. There's, there's kind of two ways to handle them, and it depends a lot on the overall fracture pattern. Um, these are different in the approach that I often had. You have to open up the whole fracture site typically, and uh, you've got to try to recreate some type of tube, uh, put the femoral diaphysis or, or metadiaphyseal region back together in order to get a revision implant in. You can do it two ways. Um, you know the implant's loose, so you're taking it out. 
Uh, and then you've got to go about figuring out if I'm going to put the femur back together first and then put a revision implant in, or if I'm going to put a revision implant in and then fix the femur. And that really depends on whether or not you think you can get an anatomic reduction of the femur. In highly comminuted fractures, uh, where it simply doesn't appear to be a viable option to get true anatomic reduction, uh, which thankfully isn't as common, you want to probably put in your revision implant first, and then you can essentially, for lack of a better term, cobble the femur back together around the implant and cable it together. Because you're relying on the distal intact bone for the fixation of your implant. Um, the more common scenario is you can put the femur back together and then you can actually put your revision implant through that. If it's an anatomic reduction, you can actually put a slightly shorter stem in where you don't have to get quite as much distal fixation. Hmm. In terms of what you do for, for, your, for your revision, the important thing to remember here is I think is that your, your revision implant is not a primary implant. Your revision implant is engaging and getting its stability from distal integration. You can do that either with what is probably the most common 95 plus percent of the time I'd say um, people are doing some type of fluted tapered titanium stem, whether that be a, a modular or a monoblock version, or you can do something like a cylindrical fully porous coated stem. Both of them work great. Um, I, I think less technical complications with the fluted tapered titanium stems, but both certainly can work for situations like this. And you really wanna make sure of the really important principle, I'm sure this still comes up on tests, is uh, the amount of distal fixation that you need in order to, to consider it adequate. The test answer to that typically has been about four centimeters of scratch fit of the stem distal in the intact femur. Certainly people are pushing that, that limit a little bit, you know, sometimes even going as little as two centimeters of scratch fit for fixation, but I, I believe you know, the test is still asking it to answer four. So when you say scratch fit, what do you mean? Yeah, so scratch fit really is how much when you get cortex to cortex or, or you're basically getting full uh, a fill of the stem distally um, in the intact uh, femoral diaphysis. So you want to get out to cortex and you want four centimeters of contact between that stem and cortical bone distal to the fracture. Got it. Okay. You know, yeah, I think that's. So, you know, that's something you're going to see on all the questions they always mentioning about, you know, you're pretty much trying to get your fixation distally now. So you see the modular fluted stems and the extensively por um, porous coated Logical. stems. Yep. So uh, very key. I think <laughs> most times when you see these bad fractures, it's, that, it, the answer is going to have something about a, a long tapered stem because you got to pass the fracture and you're trying to get your fixation distally. So, and again, um, very, yeah. Uh, yeah, now I just had a quick question for Dr. Decker. Um, is there anything that I know we were saying, you know, you could choose either or, but is there anything that has you go, you know, one way towards a, towards a fluted tapered stem versus a cylindrical? Like, is there anything that has you choose one versus the other? And then I guess, is there is there anything that's better or, you know, high yield to know about each one? Yeah, I think uh, it's, that's a really good question. I think generally speaking, um, most of the arthroplasty revision work being done now in these situations is being done with fluted tapered modular stems. And I think it has a lot to do with the fact that those, those stems offer a little bit more flexibility and probably a little less fracture risk uh, in terms of uh, propagating a distal fracture in the diaphysis than a cylindrical stem. Cylindrical stems are interesting. They have such a great track record for fixation. They really do work great, but I do think they're a little bit more technically demanding and there's some variations in the actual diameters of the stem distally uh, because of that porous coating, how it's applied. So you, you might ream for a 16, but your, your stem might be a 16.25 or a 15.75 and you actually have to measure that out before you put it in. So I think knowing what that those fluted tapered stems have modularity options um, a little bit more flexibility in terms of, uh, a little bit more consistency, I should say, in terms of the diameters and the geometry of the stem. I think that generally speaking, uh, I would almost always use some type of fluted tapered titanium stem. Monoblock versus modular is really dependent upon bone quality. Um, so I tend to use modular, but uh, patients have a lot of proximal bone loss. And I think that's important in those B3s where you've got all that bone loss, I worry about leaving an un, unprotected uh, uh, junction or where you've got a taper uh, proximally. Anytime you've got a, uh, a modular interface, you've got a risk. Uh, they can always fail, though it's rare, they can still fail. 
So if there's no bone up top or on the top of that femur, right where that junction is in the modular bodies of those stems, I'll put a monoblock in just because I don't want an opportunity to have a failure at a junction. Okay. And say with uh, the B3s, um, so yeah, so say with the V3s, you say that's when you start to think about doing the, the monoblock. So, okay. And just to be sure, is the monoblock like the allograph? Uh, like the oh, allograph my, struts? So my apologies, the monoblock, um, a monoblock fluted tapered titanium stem, essentially imagine a, a modular version like on your previous slide, but instead of having uh, a separate distal part of the stem, and proximal part of the stem with that bolt that pulls them together and that Morse taper, it's just one stem, it's one giant block. Ah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, so you get rid of that junction, which is nice, I think for just uh, for rigidity there and to decrease your modular interfaces. Um, uh, so that's what I tend to lean on that stem a little bit when there's more bone loss. Ah, the V3s, you, you alluded to it, I think those are really challenging cases because you need to really pull out all the tricks for those. Uh, when you have massive amounts of bone loss, you've essentially got to either replace all that lost bone or reconstitute all that lost bone somehow in order to support your stem. Because if your stem's not supported, it can break or it can fail in some other mode. So B3s are pretty tricky. Um, thankfully, extremely rare. So you got a lot of options there. None of them are really good though. Uh, there's, you know, you've had alluded to these uh, allograph prosthesis composites, which I think still, from a testing standpoint, I think still get tested. Yeah. I'd say these are exceptionally rare to see, um, but they're still, they're still things. So essentially the implant is put into the bone already and you've got to now implant that, that composite into the remnant femur and hope and uh, try to create a situation by which the bone of the allograft can integrate with the bone of the native femur. It's certainly an option. Uh, thankfully, I think with modern implant design, we don't see it as much anymore. I think the next, next most common thing might be impaction grafting. This is also an exceptionally rare procedure, uh, very technically demanding. Uh, hopefully you, you guys don't have what to see that one. Is? Yeah, yeah. So hopefully you guys don't have to see one during residency, but impaction grafting, uh, essentially you have to try to recreate using usually some type of metal mesh uh, something that vaguely resembles the proximal femoral anatomy or a tube. And then what you do is you use a, a, a system to impact uh, a morselized cancellous bone very tightly into this mesh tube and what's remaining of the patient's proximal femoral bone. And you, you kind of do this over and over with various size impactors until you uh, really get a, a very uh, dense uh, allograft essentially a uh, tube in the proximal femur, and then you can cement a, a slip taper or a smooth polished tapered stem into this new tube that you've made. Uh, the hope being that if you impact it uh, tight enough, you give it some structure, but because it is cancellous bone, you can cement into it and give the implant some stability. Certainly some of those can do really well, but the, the, the vast majority is, certainly have a bit of a short shelf life. Um, so it's, it's a usable technique. It's a great technique to have in your back pocket. Um, as an arthroplasty surgeon, um, but it's it's not one you want to go into the OR knowing uh, you have to do. It's just very painful. Sounds like it. Yeah, it doesn't it sound like it. Takes a long time. Yep. Yeah, it sounds it rough. Yeah, I never seen nothing like that. So. Me either. Uh, might be interesting to see maybe once or twice. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, what? Uh, when? When are you starting to think about like a proximal femur uh, for more replacement for these type patients as well? Yeah, these are so proximal femur replacements are really good, I think, in an older patient population, which are lower demand, uh, which it looks like you put on there a slide, which is good. Uh, and often in situations where you've already lost any hope at having trochanteric uh, bone or abductor function there, uh, because you really don't have much um, of an opportunity to preserve abductor function in the setting of a proximal femur replacement. So massive proximal femoral bone loss with really no hopes of recreating any type of anatomy with various allograft techniques, whether that be with strut grafts, impaction grafting, uh, uh, allograft prosthesis composites. If all those are really off the table or you have an older patient, you need to get them in and out of the OR in, a, in an expedited fashion, I think it's a reasonable surgery to do. Certainly carries the dislocation risk much higher uh, than uh, some of these other options because Without adductor function, you really lose that lateral um, uh, restraint to dislocation. So it's mm -hmm. just something to be aware of. Mm 
What about, you know, just the thought that these patients are, I, I guess, what are, what are your thoughts about this? Because you you can try to do, you know, possibly some some kind of technique to not do this such a, like a femoral replacement, but do these patients, are these patients able to weight bear right off the surgery? Yeah, it's, that's a really uh, great uh, benefit to having a proximal femoral replacement is that you really don't have any restrictions. Um, it's typically they're cemented, though there certainly are cementless options for these. Um, but you can get them weight bearing as tolerated pretty much right away. And for a, uh, kind of a low demand elderly patient where the risks to them are more associated with lying in bed, that's a great option. Yeah. 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 And then uh, Something I, guess- I, keep in mind, I know like a lot of the questions, they always, they, like you say, they're, they're always elderly. They try to give you that and they're somewhat low demand, but a lot of times in the question, they're like 85 and up when they, when they want you to pick this. <laughs> yeah. To make it really clear. Yep. Yeah. And I think uh, that's the hard part about some of these, but a questioning standpoint, I think uh, you've got so many options, none of them, which are really great. Um, you hope that they try to lead you down a road where it's very clear that the bone stock is not adequate and you need to either, you know, replace it or do an impaction graft. But I think the key is to remember what, what you're trying to solve. And in this case, it's how do we minimize the risk to the patient, give them an adequate outcome and minimize the risk. Um, for an 85 year old elderly patient, low demand, uh, I think about them like I, kind of like I said before. If my hip fracture patient who comes in with femoral neck fracture um, is at risk uh, from sitting in bed, so is my 85 year old with a periprosthetic fracture. Um, so I, my goal is to get him out of bed. If the only way to do that and get him walking is to get a proximal femur replacement, that's the answer. Okay. And um, I guess it's moving forward. How do you cheer Vancouver C? Um, you know, these, these fractures that are way distal to the stem, how do you treat those fractures? Yeah, I think the good news is I actually haven't had to treat one uh, in years. And that's there typically because our trauma colleagues do it. Uh, <laughs> these, nice. these are often the fractures that are treated just like fractures. Um, the difficult part of treating these is how do you basically manage having a stem in, uh, in the proximal femur? You treat these like uh, you use all your trauma principles um, based on your, you know, uh, fracture pattern will help determine how best to treat it, but preserve the blood supply uh, is the most important thing you can do in these fractures. I would almost exclusively use uh, lateral locking plates um, and same thing here. Uh, you want to make sure that you span the fracture uh, and um, make sure that you have adequate fixation at the level of the stem. I like this picture here. It's showing, you know, two cables, two unicortical lockers and a a screw that is uh, at the distal tip of that stem, all of that is above the fracture. So, you know, you got kind of a six cortical uh, fixation above the fracture, which is certainly, I think, adequate. Um, And you've got overlapping constructs to make sure that there's no area of the bone here that's unprotected. So I think those are the principles you got to remember when doing these. And I try to be as minimally invasive as I can. Again, can't emphasize enough, preserve the blood supply here. Uh, Your best chance at healing is blood, uh, blood supply preservation. Right. Yes, yeah, sir. Well, I, I, Dr. Decker, I, I think this was a, um, a great talk, uh, especially a great overview on very prosthetic fractures about the hip. Um, I think you did a great job. We talked about a, a bunch of the high points. We talked about the Vancouver classification, A, B, C, um, how to treat them, definitely things to look for on history and physical, and as well as risk factors. Um, is there anything else that you think that our listeners should know about this before we wrap up here? No, and I appreciate you guys. I think uh, it's it's a really fun uh, topic, uh, and I appreciate you letting me do it. And one thing I can tell you all is don't forget to look for infection. Please don't o- always look for infection in every paraprosthetic fracture. It's the number one thing you can walk away, hopefully, remembering. Um, uh, but I hope you guys got something out of it, and I appreciate you having me on. Oh, we definitely did. You know because I forgot to mention that earlier, and I feel like this is like probably a good test question out there somewhere. So let's say they come in. I don't know. They say it was hurting last week, too. It had been bothering them for about a week before they fell and it fractured. Uh, I say it's been bothering them two or three weeks, but it's been painful. Uh, you get the ESR and CRP. It's elevated. Nothing too crazy, but, I mean, there's also, uh, you know, just trauma-related could be elevated. So what's one of the things that you probably should uh, consider doing if you want to rule out infection for these? Great question. Uh, You're right. So ESR and CRP, I think, still remain useful here, but they can't be the end-all, be-all. So remember your cutoffs, uh, because this comes up for any other joints question for infection. 
an ESR cutoff of 30 millimeters uh, per hour and a CRP, depending on your units at your institution of either 10 or one um, are your cutoffs for considering it possibly infected. So get those labs. Uh, if they're elevated, regardless of the potential causes, you got to have another test to kind of assess for infection. So that can be uh, you know, synovial fluid, histopathology, or both. So again, I think the important thing is remember your values for those. Synovial fluid, uh, remember cell counts of over 3,000 or 80% neutrophils, uh, very likely infected. You can get those right on the spot while you're working on your fracture. You'll, uh, you'll send that off to the lab. You'll have your results in 30 to you know, 45 minutes. And uh, if you got a pathologist around, uh, take some synovial samples and send them off for histopathology and look for neutrophils per high powered field. Anything above five on multiple samples is pretty high uh, concern for infection. And so I think you can feel a lot more confident walking out of that surgery if you get that data knowing, hey, I treated it, it was infected, I had to treat this with, uh, you know, take the implant out and put an antibiotic spacer in, or it pretty clearly wasn't infected, I fixed the fracture, I feel confident about that. And just when they thought we were done, we drop another gem for them. That was good. I think that's actually uh, <laughs> another one, DJ yep. Howard. <laughs> <laughs> another one. Yep, I think that's good, both clinic, clinic wise. It's something thinking about when you're down there in the ED, like, hey, could it be an infection going on too? And also, uh, there has to be a test question out there on that. It just it makes sense. Uh, but again, Dr. Decker, thank you for taking this time out to uh, have this talk with us. I really enjoyed it and learned a lot myself. And I'm sure our listeners and viewers will uh, be able to get something from it as well. So thank you. Yeah, I appreciate you guys and uh, a nice work with this podcast. And I'm glad I got a chance to be part of it. And before we go, we always uh, ask our guests, is there a way for our listeners to reach out to them, whether it's their social media tags or it could possibly be uh, an email address? Do you have anything like that? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I just got on Twitter this year. Um, so Bone Doc MMD is my Twitter handle. And uh, feel free at any point to email me, uh, M Decker, uh, D E C K E R, at salud, S A L U D dot U N M dot E D U. That's my email here at work. All right. Perfect. All right. Again, thank you, Dr. Decker. And thank you for all the listeners and viewers out there. And we'll see you guys next week.